Welcome to A Conversation With, a community forum series presented by Charles R. Drew University of Medicine and Science. Today's forum will be moderated by Sylvia Drew Ivey, Senior Special Assistant to the President for Community Affairs. Our panelists represent Charles R. Drew University. They are Dr. David M. Carlisle, President and CEO, Dr. Hector Balcazar, Dean of the College of Science and Health, and Dr. Delia Santana, Assistant Director of the ELM Program and Director of Clinical Education. We invite you to get involved in the discussion. If you wish to ask questions of the panelists, please select the Q&A button in the upper right-hand corner of your screen and click Ask a Question. Thank you for joining us today. Please welcome Sylvia Drew Ivey. Welcome everyone. We're so glad that you've been able to join us this afternoon. This is the second in a series from Charles R. Drew University on the COVID-19 pandemic. In our first uh, discussion, we talked about the underserved population in South LA generally. Today, we're going to talk specifically about the challenges in the Latinx community where we are. Very happy to have with us three outstanding public health faculty and leaders uh, in the university. I want to dive right in because we have just a short hour. Please send us uh, questions uh, as you're listening to the presenters and we'll get to those as soon as we can. Uh, I want to start with Dr. Carlisle. Dr. Carlisle, this virus spares no group. But the disproportionate impact in different communities is stark. Why are we so late compiling race and ethnic data? Why do we still today have only two thirds of the data about the people who are being tested? How does it matter? Why do we need it? Dr. Carlisle? This is an example of um, one of the ongoing challenges in our healthcare system in general, but also society as a whole, because um, groups that are not necessarily considered um, to be part of the, the mainstream are often excluded, especially from dynamic um, and new, new policy trends. Um, this is why it seemed that 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 the first groups who were getting COVID-19 um, performers, entertainers, actors, athletes um, were, 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 were getting COVID-19 because they were getting tested first. And why were they getting tested first? Well, they had the resources to demand that they get tested first. The very definition of an under-resourced community, um, often communities of color, is we don't have the resources, so we couldn't yell to get heard and get tested. By the time uh, the resources arrived, it became clear that not only uh, were, uh, was COVID-19 afflicting um, communities of color, but it was disproportionately affecting and afflicting communities of color. The real face of COVID-19 in California is a face of color. And that's the reason reason that uh, Supervisor Mark Ridley Thomas asked you to set up testing at CDU, is that right? Yes, that is correct. And um, uh, all credit uh, uh, goes to Supervisor Ridley Thomas for, uh, for focusing on this because uh, I know that when he first saw the reports about the distribution of COVID-19, um, he basically had the same conclusion. If you don't shine a light on a problem, you don't know the problems there. If you don't test in South Los Angeles, you don't know how badly affected South Los Angeles is by COVID-19. And so Supervisor Ridley really Thomas made sure that the population of South Los Angeles, again, communities of color, under-resourced communities, was getting tested for COVID-19. The result was that we learned how significantly affected our communities are by COVID-19, how disproportionately affected we are by COVID-19. And how many are you testing today, Dr. Carlisle, in the testing unit in the College of Medicine? 
Well, um, I, I, I just walked onto our campus uh, a few minutes ago, kind of peeked outside the window, saw a massive line of cars, um, don't have a uh, uh, up to date uh, real time number for today's tally, but I know that we broke a thousand uh, yesterday. Uh, we've been averaging over a thousand or roughly a thousand uh, people getting tested at the uh, CDU uh, DHS uh, COVID-19 testing site. And uh, so, so that's a, a very significant number. It's much higher than when we started. When we first started, we were doing about 200 tests per day. Our design capacity was about 450. Well, all of a sudden, uh, we started doing 400 tests a day, and then we started doing 900 tests a day, and then we started breaking 1,000 with consistency. The reason for this was we specifically were marketing the testing site to the population of South Los Angeles. We recognize that this is a population, again, under-resourced, that did not have access um, to cars for mobile drive-through testing, uh, that did not have access to the internet to schedule appointments. Um, and by opening up our testing site to people who could walk in, who could, get, could uh, appear on the same day, um, who did not have cars, all of a sudden, we literally quintupled our daily volume. Not, not only are we um, pioneering walk-up uh, appointments, but I understand we're the only testing center that calls back patients who have a positive finding. Other centers are just sending them the notice. When you call a person back, it makes a big difference because you can find out if they're homeless, you can find out if they can quarantine. There's so much that goes on in that conversation. So we hope to continue that important part of our pioneering program. Dr. Balcazar, let's turn to you. Uh, you are really a, a wonderful part of our academic community uh, and are uh, helping our community-based leadership with Promotoras. Uh, your training, our future leaders, our PAs, our undergraduates in health science, you're training master's students in biomedical science and public health. You're training radiologic technicians. And all of these workers are necessary to upgrade health in our community. But we have at this time uh, the shocking information that Latinos are three times more likely to test positive than white people in this community. What are the reasons for that disparity? Well, thank you, Sylvia, and good afternoon, everyone. We have a cascade of factors affecting the Latino community. I'm going to concentrate on five factors. The first one is that Latinos suffer from a major inequalities, what we call social determinants, with lower incomes and wealth. They have lower educational attainment uh, for making very difficult to break the cycle of poverty. They have unemployment lower healthcare access, and also they are uninsured as compared not to non-whites. The second component that is important is that they have higher than average incidence of chronic diseases, of debilitating diseases such as diabetes, such mm -hmm. as uh, obesity, high blood pressure, chronic diseases, and also I will include also uh, stress. And managing these conditions is very, very challenging. The number uh, three is that they have higher vulnerability uh, to COVID exposure due to the working conditions. We know that the Latin X are part of the frontline workers who are there in many, many services uh, that include manufacturing services and their exposure is much higher. Uh, we also know that 25% of Hispanic households have multi-generational household uh, uh, families. And that means that they are making very challenge in this uh, precaution to try to protect them, given the fact that they are there together. And so the, also, if that uh, is associated with poor housing, makes it more difficult. And finally, their immigration experience, which is uh, very va varied among our Latino ex communities, make it also very challenging because they have distinct levels of acculturation, education, and social conditions that may affect this uh, high prevalence that we see in, in the COVID-19 and in, in the mortality. I, I read this morning that, that two companies have been shut down by our Department of Public Health because they failed to report as they're required 
going to report three people uh, who tested positive. Are, are the employers responsible in part for these high rates because they require people to come in, they're not reporting that they're positive uh, personnel in the in the workplace. There's so many Latinx uh, residents who are uh, essential workers. Can you talk about the employer's role in this situation? Oh, absolutely, um, Sylvia. I think uh, as we look at this pandemic and, and what it takes to really address the complexity of this pandemic, everyone should be involved, employers, uh, um, it should be very clearly um, understood that the kinds of regulations that they exist, they really should understand the employees and the risk factors. So it's very important that this is treated as a public health model where there is multifactorial elements that are going to take place. And so the employers are part of that uh, process as well. And, and in dealing with what we do to try to help, can your your favorite health uh, pioneers in the community, promotoras, be of assistance? Are you planning uh, to train them so that they can help us with this crisis? Yes, absolutely. As um, <clears throat> we are in, tell us what tell us what promotoras do. Well, promotoras are people in the community and the people that are really linked to the community. So as we think about this uh, ground level work that uh, that uh, CDU testing site has done, which they go outside, it's very important to understand that uh, we need to really give that support, that support to, to the members of the community. And if you are a member of the community, you understand that there's going to have to be a lot of uh, of components of management, promotoras and community health workers, they are part of the community. They know well the community. They, they are trusted members. So a lot of the transactional and cultural uh, elements that we can see can be developed through the model of promotoras de salud because they understand where the people are at. They understand the, the complexities of their lives. Uh I wonder um, how we can explain the fact that when we opened our testing, 70% of the people who came to be tested at CDU were Latinx. Um, can you address that, that issue, Dr. Santana? Have we established trust in the community? Why were we so successful in drawing the population uh, to uh, CDU? So thank you, Ms. Drew Ivy, for this very important question. And before I move forward, I really would like to take a moment to acknowledge CDU's good work in the community to mitigate the impact of COVID-19 under the direct leadership of President David Carlisle, or Provost Dr. Steve Michael, SVP Angela Minifield, and the deans of our programs to include Dr. Diane Breckerich, Dean of our School of Nursing. So to understand your question and answer your question, yes, there are true fears around testing and treatment, especially among undocumented Latinx individuals and groups. Also fears around deportation still exist, especially now during the pandemic, as folks not only need testing and treatment, but also want to remain employed to take care of their families. And with the current unemployment rates that is disproportionate in the Latinx community, this is truly a concern. At our CDU testing site, 70% of those tested were Latinx and 12.4 of the Latinx individuals who tested at our testing site were positive for COVID-19, the highest positive infection rate. We're finding that many of those who test positive do not have a primary care provider. So from a public health standpoint, we need to reach folks who tested positive to prevent them from being lost to follow up and treatment due to lack of insurance or source of health care. I just want to highlight that Hispanics have the highest uninsured rates of any racial or ethnic group within the United States and are almost three times as likely to be uninsured as whites. So really, how can we address this concern? Well, Latinx persons should be informed that getting a COVID-19 test or treatment will not affect their immigration status. They should be assured that their medical information is private and their doctor cannot share it with immigration officials. 
Testing is free regardless of immigration status. Latinx may also qualify for free or low cost treatment through My Health LA, and this is a healthcare program for low income LA residents, regardless of immigration status. So if you're uninsured, you can still get free testing and treatment regardless of immigration status. And I'd just like to add, if I may, that another source of fear is fear that if one is tested positive, they may lose their job. And this is anecdotal really information so far, but individuals who have lost their jobs or if work hours were cut, if you have a work permit, you may apply online for unemployment insurance with the California Employment Development Department. So, uh, but while if you're undocumented, you cannot re receive unemployment insurance, but they may be eligible for disability insurance or paid family leave. So this is information that information that when shared in culturally acceptable ways will decrease fears and stress surrounding testing and treatment for COVID-19. One, one of the benefits also of the callback uh, that CDU and the uh, MLK outpatient clinic are doing. Dr. Ellen Rothman has been making sure that everyone gets called who is positive. And they find that 30% of the people who are testing with us um, do not have a medical home. So a third pioneering effort is to sign those people up for care at the outpatient clinic. So not only have they taken care of themselves by coming in to get tested, but they have found a way to find a medical home. So we're very, very happy for that because that, that takes care of them, whether they test positive, whether they're members of their families who do not test positive, but also need medical homes. We want people to be in care. Dr. Carlisle, you always talk about the difference between physicians and nurses and medical uh, personnel and public health. Can you just give a word about what the difference is be between those two things? Um, the medical uh, care uh, situation and uh, the public health situation that we are in today. Well, this is a, this is a really good point because um, if we want to be really effective in combating COVID-19, um, we need to take a public health approach uh, to that challenge. Um, our, our traditional medical approach with drugs and, and things like that is, is not effective right now because we don't have drugs to fight COVID-19. We're starting to make progress with things like dexamethasone and remsitivir and, and, and things like this, but those, those medications only take effect or only useful after somebody is admitted to the hospital. Uh, we don't have medications to prevent people from getting COVID-19, and we certainly don't have a vaccine right now, but we do have effective public health measures. And one of those effective public health measures is wearing a face mask. Um, we can significantly control the spread of COVID-19 if everyone wears a face mask when they go outside. If there's any lesson that comes from New York City that was the number one epicenter by far in this country a couple of months ago in terms of COVID-19. It's the success of public health measures in driving down COVID-19 incidence rates um, to the basement. Co New York City went from here, the national leader by far, down to here, simply by effective public health measures. And that's an encouraging message for us because we can imp implement those measures right here in California. Uh, we can implement those measures right here in LA County, and we can be successful in combating COVID-19 if we can successfully get everybody to um, adhere to and practice good public health measures. Even though the medical part is a smaller part of uh, our, our arsenal of approaches to dealing with this, and the public health piece is much bigger, um, the, the medical um, uh, personnel is, is an important part as well. Uh, we have such a dearth of Latinx physicians and African American physicians. What can we do to improve that, uh, that number of physicians? What are, what are you doing at CDU to address that? 
Well, um, our university, Charles R. Drew University of Medicine and Science, is certainly recognized as a, a leading contributor to adding to the diversity of the health professions, uh, medicine, nursing, public health, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and this is a, something that I'm very proud of as president of Charles R. Drew University, the fact that we are so successful at doing this. In fact, we're so successful that CDU was ranked as the number two, number two most diverse private not-for-profit four-year university in the entire country. And that says we've been successful at doing this. If we want to diversify the health professions, number one, we need to make it a priority. Um, being a doctor is not a luxury. Um, it's something that we need to do to improve the health of our society. And we need to get doctors and nurses and dentists and pharmacists and optometrists who reflect the diversity of the communities that they serve um, in order to make sure that they are encouraged and incentivized and want to practice in under-resourced communities. We can get a, we can go a long way to addressing the issues of under-resourced communities by getting more providers who come from those communities, who reflect those communities, who care about those communities. So this is not just a educational luxury. This is a necessity if we want to address the gaps in healthcare that afflict these communities and as a result, afflict our society as a whole. Dr. Balcazar, um, the, our new uh, medical students this year um, are 28% first generation college students. 86% um, of them were trained at uh, University of California uh, col uh, colleges before they came to us. Um, and one of them was born at Martin Luther King Hospital. So we're very, very proud and excited about the class coming in. You have similar students coming into the College of Health Sciences. We are really taking people uh, into training at CDU um, and it's very successful. Would you talk about how, uh, how that works in the College of Health Sciences that we are really um, helping people who haven't had uh, the advantages that many other homes have had? Well, what is very exciting, Sylvia, in our uh, university is that we really are very keen to address uh, issues of, of inequity, issues of social justice. So a lot of our programs are geared to provide those students that enter the university with the tools that they require, even in, at the first year of the undergraduate program, to bring them that advantage that CDU has for understanding communities, for understanding relational elements, for exploring the variety of science uh, that requires to, to build for the success to, to tell them about this uh, public health model that Dr. Carlo mentioned, that they could actually part be participants in the health profession's education, to not only be medical doctors, but be physician assistants, to be radiologic technologists, to, to be biomedical scientists, to be public health scientists, so that they can begin to establish uh, opportunities for themselves and to serve the community well with the values and mission that we have here at Charles R. Drew University of Medicine and Science. So I'm very proud to be the dean of, of this opportunity to bring those students to the undergraduate program and build that, uh, that legacy for them. And they are often going out into communities, providing community service, even as they're training. Is that right? That's correct. So we are trying to really build um, a meaningful uh, re a com community efforts that they can engage as part of their uh, um, stay here with us so that they will really see the kinds of uh, inequities that we have in our communities and they will then understand this complexity that, that we need to understand for addressing COVID-19 and many other uh, health related uh, concerns that we have that our uh, underserved and under resourced communities are suffering. Dr. Santana, your students in the School of Nursing have really been the backbone of our testing uh, because they volunteered. We're, we're starting early in the mornings. We've gone holidays, weekends, uh, being here for the, the people who have come in needing testing. They could get tested here. The students have been there. They've been so enthusiastic. They've been so committed. 
to taking care of this community. We're we're just so grateful for that. Is that something that they've done on their own, or is the leadership of the nursing school encouraging? How how have we been so blessed to have all of those lovely students out there? And so Sylvia, thank you so much for that question. Um, it's been a, an, a great opportunity for the students to be able to um, uh, support the COVID testing site. And this was done, um, it, it just appears as though when we saw the, the COVID testing site, we used that as an opportunity for students to give back to the, com the community under the di direct leadership of our Dean Diane Breckenridge and our enthusiastic faculty and our students have been servicing that site day in and day out like you said on holidays on weekends and they've been really happy about it um, and they've been using this opportunity to complete some of their clinical experiences so it's actually been a win-win situation I believe for the students giving back to the community in a meaningful way and for the School of Nursing to accomplish its goals in training uh, nurses to include the entry-level master's program and our nurse practitioners as well and or RN to BSN program to get in there and work with the community to, to mobilize the community and really give back. So thank you for that. And, and Dr. Carlisle, your expertise with a, a PhD and a master's degree in public health has been invaluable to us in keeping the students informed, keeping the community informed day by day. Just this morning, you went over all the data to the executive staff uh, and you said it, it, uh, we're in a worse situation today than we've been uh, all the days of the pandemic. Is that correct? Is that your assessment of where we are today? Uh, yes, that's certainly true in, in LA County. Um, uh, when you look at the, the number of new cases, uh, we have more cases per day, a greater incidence now um, at the end of July than we had um, uh, in the middle of March uh, when the uh, disease was first appearing. Of course, we were very concerned because we were seeing something new and it was increasing. But frankly, today we have more cases. We have a, a higher incidence rate uh, than we did back in March. Uh, we have we have certainly a higher number of fatalities. Um, LA LA County experienced its um, its its three highest days on record in terms of case fatalities during the month of July. Uh, so so yes, uh, this is a fire that's probably burning brighter now. Uh, than it than it has been in the past, and um, I know that we went through this period during the summer where we thought that we could uh, reopen society, uh, but the uh, but we learned that that was not the case, and 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 now uh, COVID nineteen is is an even bigger challenge than than it was before. Now, of course, early on in the in the pandemic, we were still learning much more about uh, the nature of the process, how people got it, and things like that. Uh, but but the reality is today that this is a uh, as big of a problem uh, as it's ever been over the past six months and probably even bigger than it's ever been over the past six months. And that's why we need to basically um, not let up on our public health population based focus in terms of combating COVID-19. Are you hopeful that we will be finding a, a vaccine soon? Are you hopeful oh, yes. about um, that? Yes, uh, uh, certainly as a um, as somebody who who believes in the importance of vaccination in terms of fighting a variety of conditions, uh, it is our hope and uh, indeed our expectation that we will develop a vaccine to fight COVID-19. Uh, but I, I have to say that by by um, by tempering it uh, with a, a, a bit of um, a warning in that there are still conditions today uh, for which we've been searching for vaccines where we have not found an effective vaccine. And the most prominent one in that regard is HIV AIDS. And we've been fighting for a vaccine, searching for one uh, now for, for several decades, and it has eluded us. We've also, of course, been searching for a vaccine for the, the common cold, um, which part of which we know is, is uh, caused by, to a certain extent, uh, coronaviruses, a certain portion of the common cold. And we have not found a vaccine for the common cold. So, so it's it's possible 
um, that we, we cannot find a vaccine for, for COVID-19 for the novel coronavirus. But that said, I know that we are working hard to, to find one. And, and frankly, the results are, are promising so far. We have, a, we have several agents that are either in or approaching phase three clinical trials with a lot, like widespread population testing. And the results are good in terms of their ability to produce antibodies. Uh, so, so I'm hopeful that we will have a vaccine to, uh, to prevent the spread and acquisition of COVID-19. But again, uh, Dr. Santana, this is where our community outreach is so important. Uh, a, a recent poll found that among the Latinx population, only 37% were presently willing to take a vaccine should one be discovered. Only 25% of African Americans were willing. So we're going to have to reach out again as we reached out to say, please come and test. You'll be safe here at, at CDU. We're not reporting anybody. We want to test you, we want to make you safe. We have to reach out again through our trusted community outreach workers, through our, our uh, probatorious connections uh, to, to tell people that it will be all right, that we are going to be with them and we're not going to suggest they do anything. Is that something you see as a role for CDU going forward when and if we do get such a vaccine? Oh, most definitely. I think that um, the, we, we would be employing similar um, collaboratives and uh, coalitions as exists right now with our, our CDU COVID-19 testing site. Currently, uh, students are uh, pro provided or, or uh, set up in groups and they do go out to the community knocking on doors to let uh, folks know that um, the COVID the testing site exists. So that would be a similar process if and when um, actually I heard on the news this morning that they're thinking about a vaccine this year. Um, who knows? <laughs> However, um, it, there would be a similar uh, deployment of students in the community um, to actually reach these folks along with social media, of course. But in the Latinx community, a lot uh, of word of mouth goes a long way and and um, working with uh, promoters in the community as well, local community leaders as well will will have a direct impact on increasing uh, interest in vaccination. Absolutely. Yeah, and and we at, at Drew have community faculty that are reaching out to the Latin churches and that's made a big difference also. I want to turn now to the questions that have come in from our listeners. Um, uh, here is one. Recently, a letter was released by 150 doctors recommending shut it down, start it over, get it right. What does that mean? I'm not sure what they're shut what down. <laughs> I'm not sure what that question means. Uh, Let's go to another one. I'm I'm not clear on what the what the answer with, with the with the person propounding that clarify it a little bit and we'll come back to it. Uh, is there any community outreach to educate protesting wearing mask and community health safety from CDU? And I think you were just speaking to that, Dr. Santana, that that we are we are reaching out. We are doing flyers. We are. Um, uh, Dr. Carlisle is on the radio, is on the television. Uh, Dr. Prothro Stith, who's our Dean of Medicine, was on CNN recently, four times in one day, talking about what's happening in our testing program. So if, if we don't reach out, we're not doing our job. We know that. And, and uh, generating trust is so imperative because people will not go where they, they do not feel trust. And I think we've been working hard to maintain that trust by the outreach that we're doing. Um, another question is, is there a problem with getting tests back in real time? You might already have addressed this, but how, how are you handling this issue at CDU? Dr. Carlisle, do you want to feel that one? Uh, sure. I, I, I know that this has been one of the biggest challenges of our of our uh, COVID-19 fight and is, is one of the um, unfortunate lessons learned. Um, frankly, uh, the United States 
um, was not geared up um, uh, to the extent that we should have been to ensure that we have fully and uh, appropriately implemented COVID-19 testing, uh, particularly PCR testing uh, for COVID-19. Um, in contrast to some other nations that were able to um, more fully implement widespread COVID-19 PCR testing, the United States lagged in our testing rates. And uh, this was unfortunate because it, it, it probably contributed to um, the, the dissemination of COVID-19 uh, to the extent that it has occurred throughout the United States. If you have a positive test result, you know that you have COVID-19, you know that you need to self-isolate, and you know that if you get worse, you need to see, you need to seek health care. If without that positive test result, you can't do any of that because um, you don't know reality. You know that you, can, you need to protect your family. Um, so now one of the challenges is in addition to getting people tested, making sure that people are getting results in a, um, uh, in a timely basis soon enough so that they can respond effectively to having that positive result or they can be reassured with a negative result. This is another challenge that we're facing today and we can do much better than we're doing right now in terms of making this reality. So this is a priority in terms of fighting COVID-19, making sure that we are getting enough people tested and making sure that the results are coming back in a timely way so they can be effectively meaningful. Good. Dr. Balcazar, we, we know uh, we need to be part of our younger generation. Uh, many won't wear a mask. Uh, there was a report just today in the Washington Post saying nationally, uh, uh, that young people are now um, becoming more positive than uh, the older group, but they are going back into their homes and infecting older members of their households. Um, we have a tremendous number of households that are multi-generational in, in African-American, Latinx, and Asian families in Los Angeles. What, what do we do about that? <clears throat> Thank you, Sylvia, for that question. I think um, in, in trying to address this outreach to communities, I think it's very important that we really think of outreach as a complex process, either with the young adults, with the youth. I think it's not only that easy just to think about one way, but many ways to reach our communities. We have to really establish the kinds of uh, in, uh, transactions and engagement with our youth. We need to tell them about the, the kinds of uh, risks that they might be exposing to their families. So that will mean that we will engage with them through uh, youth educators, through information, so that they can begin to see the kinds of issues that they have to be aware. So it's very important that, for example, for the Latino community, as we talked about multi-generational families, that uh, that transaction perhaps can be done by a community outreach promotor, where they understand and listen to the youth. They will understand what kinds of uh, precautions and what kinds of workshops and mm -hmm. what kinds of issues that they will have. So it's always important to try to understand that reaching out to a particular segment of our population requires investment, requires a really understanding when and listening well to them so that we can then propose different strategies that may work for different communities at different times. Yeah, young people don't necessarily speak the same language as older folks, do they? That's correct. That's correct. So, <laughs> Whether it's Spanish or English. That's right. Uh, Dr. Carlo, can uh, can you go back to that first question? Uh, recently, a letter was released by 150 physicians recommending shut it down, start it over, and get it right. Uh, maybe you can translate that. What is it, what are they saying? Well, they're uh, they're they're speaking to um locking down society to combat COVID-19 I see. Um, okay. and I, I was able to while we were um on the air here um uh, uh, able to look up the letter so I, I I did find it and um uh this is a it's a very strong statement but there is there is truth to this statement um one of the the most effective things that we can do to prevent transmission is to return to 
even stricter social isolation, social distancing. In fact, if we want to be as 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 firm as possible, um, one of the things that we can do is is revisiting locking down our society. If people are not interacting, they're not spreading COVID-19. Um, now, I did not receive this letter myself. I did not sign it, but I recognize the position that the signers um, have adopted and their position is correct. If we want to be as aggressive as possible, then we need to revisit locking down, <clears throat> relocking down society. But that comes at, at, at a cost. And it comes at a cost in terms of um, the economy. It comes at co the cost of jobs. It comes at, at the cost of social isolation. It comes at the cost of loneliness, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, this is not an easy solution. And, and this is why um, uh, one of the things that's important uh, if, we, uh, if we're using social isolation is to make sure that we are supplementing and providing um, incomes to sustain society. Uh, those $600 checks that people have been getting, those are, have been meaningful for individuals because it means that if you have lost your, your um, essential first line job, you might be um, a, a, an Uber driver, you might be a, a restaurant worker um, and you've lost your job. Now you have income that can replace uh, that lost income. Uh, if we can't do that again, uh, then we probably should not be revisiting a total lockdown on society because it means that people are going to be without food. They're going to be without income. They're not going to be able to support their families. And so it's a real balancing act um, that policymakers have to have to consider in, in responding in to the, this. But yes, um, in, in terms of a pure, um, purely strong approach to fighting COVID-19, uh, this statement um, is an accurate statement. Shut it down, start over and get it right. Because if we learned anything from our, our states like Florida, like Arizona, like Texas, and yes, like California, um, when we reopened society, COVID-19 came back with a vengeance. Dr. Santana, um, the recent poll by Pub the Public Policy Institute found that less than half of the Latinx population uh, say they could work at home if we shut down again. The majority of black and white responders said that, that, that they could. So that was a big difference in the response between uh, those communities. Uh, they could not work at home. They have to, they are essential workers and the income is pivotal to the maintenance of their families. What do, what do we do about that? How do you respond to that? that? That's actually a great question, um, uh, Sylvia. Many Latinos have jobs that do not allow them to stay at home during this time. Remember that Latino, Latinx community are at are the um, these are folks who are working in the um, service environment. So they are the ones who are um, working in the uh, uh, service, uh, um, the grocery stores, health. They are the folks who are at the forefront. So they cannot stay home um, in order to you know take care of their families or or meet their daily needs so that um, we should be able to um, support the any any um, let's see any policies that support latinos being able to um, stay at home in the event that they have uh, contracted or um, being positive for the coronavirus. There is unemployment insurance that we talked about before. The Latinx communities need to be in, uh, informed that in the event that they have to stay at home to be quarantined or anything like that, that they can receive unemployment. But this is the main situation where they are not able to work from home given the types of service uh, required jobs that they have. Is this problem, Dr. Balcazar, a problem for all of us, uh, not just for the people who are impacted in the way Dr. Santana is describing? What is the stake of the people who are 
uh, on the west side and doing fine and have access to everything they need? Why should they care about the problems that we're talking about? Well, um, I think it's a, a, a matter of, of trying to understand the vulnerabilities of uh, where, what communities do you believe are more vulnerable than others? I think, uh, as Dr. Carlin mentioned, this should be a public health measure where everyone should be aware that by protecting themselves, they're protecting their neighbor. By protecting the, the space, they're protecting their neighbor. But also when we think about uh, people that are, as Dr. Santana mentioned, more vulnerable in circumstances where they might not have that choice, where they are going to be with more difficulties because their support system and their work system is, is going to be very difficult. Yes, yeah, some of the communities in, as you mentioned, in upper uh, and, and, and mid socioeconomic areas, perhaps the, the issues that they have to address being a resource community may be different, but uh, no matter what, the idea is that everyone should be thinking about for the benefit of, of their neighbor. Everybody should have that consciousness about that if I protect myself, I protect somebody else. If I go out, that means that I will be protecting the, the, that family that is going to be, could be affected and die. So I think uh, uh, it's really important to try to understand the different uh, communities that we work with and sometimes try to understand how best we then relate to those communities and what are some of the, the kinds of issues that they are under, which are, are, are not the same. Uh, that's unfortunately, they're not the same. They're not there with the same resources, that they're not equipped in the same way. So it is, uh, if everything would be equal, everyone should be um, able and willing to, to understand that if you protect um, yourself, you protect somebody else. No? If I, if I may, Dr. Sylvia, Paula. yes, if I may, this is one of the issues facing the training of health professionals. If you come from a middle class, upper middle class, upper class family, and you see somebody who's sick, it's very easy to say, oh, take a couple of days off and, um, and you know, get it, get it, I'll, I'll write you a note so you can go back and work. But if you come from an under-resourced community, you know that a couple of days off will cost that person their job. They will lose the ability to feed their families. They may be unemployed after that for weeks. And this applies certainly to COVID-19 as well. Um, people who are, are produce, putting food on our tables, uh, people who are, are taking us to work, um, people who are on the streets every day, they can't afford to take time off because if they do, they'll lose their jobs and they'll lose their ability to support their families. So we need this more enlightened approach to healthcare in general and COVID-19 specifically as we're devising policies to support the populations that are most affected by COVID-19. Yes, Dr. Santana, and then I'm going to go back to the questions. Go ahead. You wanted to add on there. I just wanted to add um, something that is so important to us. COVID-19 actually highlights a history of discrimination and unequal access to healthy environments and medical care, which makes it hard to prevent and control health problems among Latinx populations. We need to pay attention to that. I'd like to point out that this pandemic has created a perfect storm. So we have to look at social determinants of health, higher than average incidences of chronic diseases such as hypertension, diabetes, kidney disease that put people at greater risk for COVID-19 complications. In addition to the distrust of the healthcare system and lack of access to regular health care. And remember that this population Latinx have the highest rate of on, on insurance. So we really need to be able to focus on whatever the root causes are that puts Latinx at the reported 55% of cases and 45% of death rates from COVID-19 that we see across the state of California. So thank um, you. Yeah, thank you. Um, very, very good point about the, the history of disparities, which plays in uh, profoundly in this, in this context. We have a question, if a family member had COVID-19, can they get it again? That's a worry that I've heard in number of people expressed. Do we know, Dr. Carlisle, do we know yes or no on that question? 
I think we don't know yes uh, or no um, specifically. Uh, there, there's there's certainly um, anecdotal evidence uh, that individuals can be um, can can be um, afflicted uh, by COVID-19 a second time. That's not the same thing as saying they can get infected with COVID-19 a second time. We're still learning about COVID-19. Um, we don't know if this is a reactivation of a previous infection or a brand new infection. We don't know if it's, it might be a brand new infection with the same exactly the same virus or maybe it's a slightly different version of the virus. There's still things that we don't know. But yeah, there, there's, there's increasing um, anecdotal evidence that you can become um, um, afflicted uh, by COVID-19 uh, more than once. Uh, and we're still waiting for that to be determined. So, so I would say that, yes, uh, there's still a worry there. And um, the flip side is certainly um, relevant. Just because you've had COVID-19 doesn't mean that you can stop adhering and practicing good public health measures. It doesn't mean that you can walk around without a mask. It doesn't mean that you can go out and, and, and hang out in a bar. No, we can't say that at, at all right now. Uh, uh, someone writes in, uh, um, if um, the CDU is still planning to become its own medical school, uh, and if so, when? Dr. Carlisle, do you want to take that one also? Yes, and, and from the day that we were founded in 1966, in fact, even prior to that, it's always been the aspiration of our university, Charles Larger University of Medicine and Science, to um, operate a uh, autonomous independent medical school. In fact, if you look at recommendation 2.5 from the California Future Health Workforce uh, Commission uh, from two years ago, you'll see a recommendation that CDU open a uh, independent school in addition to our collaborative relationship in, in medical education with the David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA. Uh, the reason the commission called for this is that it's well known uh, that our students reflect the population diversity of the state of California. Um, graduates of CDU of all of our programs are more likely to be practicing primary care or more likely to be working in under, underserved, under-resourced communities. So the contribution of the university to the health professions is a significant one and policymakers uh, recognize it and support it. Dr. Uh, Balcazar, thank you, Dr. Carlisle. Um, there's a question about whether or not there's a labor force being developed by the city of LA to have people call and trace. Uh, does something like, like that already uh, exist or is that something we have to do as a city and as a county? Yeah, thank you, Sylvia. Yes, um, uh, the county has uh, developed a process by which they are uh, um, calling people from their own uh, uh, um, area their own uh, constituencies, uh, volunteers to, to do uh, the process of, uh, of calling the university. Uh, UCLA is involved with other universities. And we've been actually talking to them a little bit about that experience when the, the uh, county uh, and also the state of Texas, the state of California is calling for that uh, volunteers. But these volunteers could be not, uh, uh, could be uh, librarians, it could be anyone. And what we call upon is that uh, perhaps uh, this is an opportunity to really think about it, this strategy as perhaps there could be other more cost effective strategies like public health strategies is calling the developing of, for example, people from the community health workers where they can begin to start being trained, not only in the COVID component for the, the context of tracing, but also for, as Dr. Santana mentioned in us, the issue of uh, comorbidities and the social determinants of health. So yes, this is a perfect opportunity to develop a labor force that could be really in integrated with the public health workforce and make it sustainable. Dr. Santana? Yes, I'd like to add to uh, Dr. Balcazar's uh, explanation of that. So the public health department has deployed such a, an, an effort uh, and they are trying to recruit folks all over to get on board so that they can train um, contact tracers. So what we're doing in the School of Nursing is 
I am uh, definitely getting, I have gotten in touch with the Department of Public Health, all of uh, about 30 or, or I, probably about 60 of our nurses will be trained as contact tracers and they will be assisting uh, next semester the public health department in contact tracing. So these are some of the ways that CDU and School of Nursing and any of the other um, schools can actually become a part of this fight against this pandemic. It's very easy to get that training and jump on board and um, do some contact tracing out there. Uh, Dr. Carlisle, uh, we, we just have a few uh, moments uh, more. One of the things that uh, has happened as a result of our involvement uh, in the testing at CDU is that we have a much greater uh, connect with our African American, Latino, and Asian Pacific Islander neighbors. Uh, this community has changed demographically since the start of the university after the Watts Rebellion. Um, um, but the, the positive impact of, of really being a partner in healthcare to people who are most at risk has really been a, a gift to CDU. And I want to close our session by thanking uh, the community for their trust in you, uh, their trust in your leadership, uh, making uh, resources available from their own tax dollars to LA County to make this testing available. And we hope that it will go on uh, as we continue to struggle in this pandemic. Um, and I hope we will continue to be the very special partner uh, with our community, with our county, um, until we get to the point where we turn a corner, which I'm, I'm hoping and praying that we will. So thank you very, very much, all three of you. Dr. Balcazar, it's so good to talk to you. Dr. Santana, uh, thank you. Thank your, your colleagues in the sc School of Nursing. Thank you for your leadership. And Dr. Carlisle will continue to rely on you for guidance, for information, for staying abreast, uh, and for keeping all of us and our loved ones safe as well as the people in our community. So thank you and good afternoon.